The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today we are going to spend a little bit of time discussing the Bimber reading, which uh, introduces a really important concept for us uh, that is the concept of technological determinism. Uh, I think this is particularly important in our look at music and technology because music technologies, I think, raise really interesting questions and pose really interesting examples and counterexamples of this question of technological determinism. So we'll spend a little time talking about that. Then we're going to experiment with some electromagnetic properties of sound generation. So we're going to generate uh, a uh, mini uh, telharmonium light, as Collins likes to say, using a simple motor. We're going to uh, experiment with a humbucker pickup and see what kind of sounds we can pick up with that. And then we're going to build a little oscillator using the uh, Schmidt trigger uh, model that Collins nicely provides for us. Good? Questions? Um, in general, keep in mind, we will have a th uh, another quiz next Thursday, um, a week from today. That's right. Yeah. So keep that in mind. OK, good. So let's start with the Bimber article. And I believe, Jillian, you were responsible for this one. OK, so basically this article is talking about, as you said, technological determinism, which he kind of describes as the views on relationships between technology and human activity, or the significance of technology to this social change. But he kind of talks about how okay. uh, there's a huge debate on what the concept actually means. Right. Um, so he goes through how there's sort of three types of technological determinism. Uh -huh. That would be norm-based accounts, logical sequence accounts, and unintended, unintended consequence accounts. Um, <clears throat> so okay. he kind of describes those and goes through different uh, views on each of those. OK, good. And the big picture, his goal, his, his big question for this article is what? Um, basically, like, how technology relates to social aspects, or does it really? OK, so how, how technology relates to culture and society, uh, what action, what power technology has in relation to society and culture. And specifically, this article, on the biggest picture, he's asking a question that doesn't really concern us, but what's the big question he's trying to answer with this article? Did what Marx said, was it really technical, technological? Was Marx a technological determinist? That's sort of the big question, but that's the least interesting for us. Uh, <laughs> People debate that a lot, and that's an interesting issue, but that's not really relevant for us. Our, this uh, article for us provides us with a really nice way of just getting an introduction to some of the different approaches to what technological determinism is. So let's uh, first discuss a little bit about what is technological determinism. Without looking at his three cases, uh, let's just talk about this in general. What is this idea of technological determinism? Uh, just in general, try from the highest, most broadest description first. I mean, so you have this aspect of does technology affect us, and how in that case, how much does it affect us? And then there's also the deterministic part where it's like, well, is what's going to happen in technology really deterministic? So, and so in that sense, how much do we affect it? Right. Do we actually have control over that technology? Right. I think in the biggest, in the biggest sense, that's the, that's the question we're trying to answer here. Um, is technology an independent force that acts on its own, or do we have some control? I think in the biggest sense, that's the question this gets to. Uh, what is this concept of determinism in general? Determinism? Do you have free will? Or do yeah, it basically gets to the question of free will. Determinism, why, would, how, why is determinism, I mean, how could we not have free will? What are you talking about? I make choices. Yeah? It's the say that possibly in the course of human history or any event that happens is all predetermined by the choices that we made in the past. So it's hard to say like whether or not your free will is actually your decision or that's just a conclusion of some other decision that was made. Right, but in that case, then you still have decisions playing a part. That might be a sort of soft determinism. A hard determinism taken further would be what? <laughs> right, and why not? Why don't you have any choices? I mean, uh, 
I mean, everything is just a bunch of chemical reactions, right? It's just all <laughs> physics. It's all physics. It's all chemical reactions. It's all causal change, causality and causal change. One reaction, one physical law interacts, results in another, and that chain of causal actions leads in a result. That's the idea of determinism. And if that is taken to its logical extreme, then we don't have any room for free will. And that's a debate we'll let the philosophers uh, discuss. It doesn't really bother us. Um, well, it does. Sometimes it bothers me. <laughs> but I feel like I have free will, and you probably all do too. So we can work with that assumption just because it's a little more practical. So then the other, the other major technological determinism is not like determinism in general, but does technology determine social things? Like, does it cause social things to happen? So like, does the fact that uh, the typewriter came about at a certain time make certain, certain things happen right. because of the typewriter, not the right. other way around? Not like, did the typewriter get invented because of social things? Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, the idea that technologies on their own, just by existing, play a part in the causal chain independent of human actions. That's really at the core of the issue. Um, OK, we'll talk about that more. But let's look at Bimber's uh, three, uh, he categorizes three groups of uh, approaches, accounts of technological determinism. He's trying to narrow the field, because so many people have talked about this. He's trying to narrow the field down and sort of uh, categorize the ideas about this. Let's start with the norm-based account. What's the norm-based account? What are the norms that he's talking about? So basically that technology is like a human activity. People create technology. They get together to make things. Um, and their actions are governed by like, whatever political body is ruling at the time. Um, and also he talks about kind of like the favor of productivity over like ethical things. Right, um, right. Okay. That's the key, I think that's the key point in norm-based accounts. Uh, somebody else want to build on that idea, norm-based? So the norms, he's talking about, uh, he's basically talking about where people give up some control to technology, right? Giving up some control to technology. And he's talking about that based on these norms. And what are the norms? You mentioned one of the norms that he mentions, which was, uh, which one did you say? Productivity. Productivity. Productivity, that's right. What are some of the other norms that he describes? Logic. 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 And often with logic is reason. Logic, reason, productivity, efficiency. Those are the norms that he's talking about in the norms-based account. And what he's talking about, how, how this is a sort of technological determinism, is that people say, well, I don't know if I like this technology, but it makes my life easier. It's more uh, efficient, or it's uh, a reasonable approach. That's sort of a giving up of some control, but not all control. Ultimately, does he say that the norm-based account is a technological determinism? No. no. He rejects it because humans still play some role, but don't have, um, but don't have complete control. Okay, the second one. Uh, let's go to, let's jump to unintended consequences. What are the unintended consequences? So basically you have a technology and you're like creating it for some purpose and then way down the road it has some completely different effect that you can Good, good. Now, how is that a technological, suggests perhaps a technological determinism? I mean, for instance, like, he brought up the example of cars. So they were kind of created to, like, clean up the streets so there wouldn't be horses everywhere or whatever. Right. Um, and then it, you know, kind of led to this whole CO2 emissions. <laughs> right. Was, that's kind of a technological determinism because, you know, we couldn't have prevented that because we couldn't have predicted it in the first place. Yeah, unintended consequences. Technologies have results that we may not foresee, and that gives us a sign that the technology, it suggests perhaps that the technology has some sort of agency, that technology is doing something out of our control. That's another reason why it might be seen as a technological determinism. Does Bimber ultimately say that it's a technological determinism? No, he cuts that one out too. And why? makes the distinction that because it's just because it's uncontrollable and like unintended doesn't mean that it's deterministic. Right, that's true. And also that humans still have agency, right? Humans still played a role in in creating those technologies, introducing them. So it doesn't completely remove the human agency. Finally, we get to the logical sequence account, which is the one that he wants to hold up as the 
real, pure technological determinism. And what is the logical sequence account? Um, the technology itself creates the social change. Technology creates social change. That's one aspect of the logical sequence account. What are some other aspects of the logical sequence account? Yeah. Well, that, that the existing technologies will always entirely determine what the next technologies will like, you know, emerge. Right, and that there's a logical sequence. Both it's logical, one leads to another, and that there's a sequence. Um, anybody want to flesh out that idea a little bit more? I mean, with this logical sequence, can we think of an example of how somebody might interpret this logical sequence in our world or in a, uh, some sort of practical context? Steam before combustion. Yeah, like you have to go through the steam engine before we go through combustion engine, before we move through different technologies. Um, Bronze age. To right. We see this all the time in uh, simulation games, right? Like SimWorld or something where, you know, you're building a little artificial culture and you have to go through the Iron Age before you do this and that. And that's an idea of a logical sequence of technology. Does it have to be like that? Do you agree? Is that? Oh, well, I was just going to say that it was regardless of where it was and who. That's right. Right. The logical sequence happens regardless of geography, regardless of, of background, ethnicity, climate, cultural context, uh, economics, politics. At first, I disagree. I mean, I may be biased because we just read the Pitch Biker article. Uh -huh. But basically, this is making everything linear, which, as we found out, isn't really the best model. Right. So it does suggest a linear, a linear trajectory. That's absolutely right. I think that's a good flaw. What else? Do you that you makes you wonder about this logical sequence? Um, it's very like Western Eurocentric. It's about like our sequence that we've gone through as right. the sequences that happen <laughs> elsewhere. Yeah. So the idea that you need to go through certain steps and like now with globalization, you see like in Africa they use cell phones, but they don't use landline phones. That's a great example. Like, yeah. There's, it's not necessarily like they. All these things. That's true. We are. We have great examples of that. And of course, the idea that the logical sequence is our sequence <laughs> is 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 pretty. Uh, I think true. I, I think it becomes kind of tautological because once you look back and you see which steps have occurred, you know, it's hard to imagine another set of steps occurring. In fact, I mean, I, I guess it goes hand in hand with like the deterministic model of the universe. Right. You know, because we assume that. If, if, if you assume determinism in the universe, then obviously technology will determine its results. Right. But of course, we have people that are embracing technological determinism without really being philosophical determinists. <laughs> um, so, uh, great. So that's Bimber. Uh, and Bimber sets this out, and that's the really important thing for us. Now that we have a good idea of technological deter determinism, he doesn't want to say these other things are technological determinism, but I think we can think of them as technological determinism light. They're there. They happen. Um, so the reason why I find this concept so interesting and relevant to us is because we find aspects of technological determinism all around us in our lives in commentary that people offer both in the media and in casual discourse. And I'm wondering if you guys can think of some casual ways in which people reinforce or suggest technological determinism. Casual ways people talk about technology. I mean, just our idea of the future. We've predetermined what the future is supposed to look like uh -huh. in science fiction. <laughs> so now if someone wants to design a product that looks futuristic, then well, they have a model to work with already, even though it hasn't happened yet. Interesting, interesting. Is that, is that an is that, a, how is that, are, are people making choices there though, or are they? I guess we've made a choice that's supposed to drive some type of aesthetics of our development. Right? Yeah. In terms of the, products that people develop and how cars look. I think that's I think there's two layers there. One is not technological determinism, that it's sort of the result of, of creativity, of fancy that imagines that future. That's one part. The the part that's technological deterministic about that is the idea that that future looks a certain way and is often better or good or more efficient or more Star Trek like. <laughs> Do you think that you can consider like a social aesthetic as falling under a norm, or would that maybe not qualify? What do you mean a social aesthetic? So like, like I mean, like like he was saying, like um, like we have this predetermined like way, like just because of how popular the idea of the future was, like I guess maybe through the sixties, like the 
the stereotypical Star Trek idea. Right. Like, you know, and then you have like an idea of what a spaceship looks like, even though it does not exist. Right. Like, can you call that if you can define that as a social aesthetic, can you call that a norm for certain like, Yeah, that's interesting. I think file that under norm based accounts. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I think it is a norm. I think it is there's some freedom there though, right? Because we can imagine other things. So I think science fiction offers some freedom and actually some ways out of a technological deterministic approach. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, one way in which I think that we see technological determinism is whenever people give agency to technologies. So remember when we were reading the Stern article and he kept on saying, the MP3 does this. The MP3 has changed the way that we listen to. That sentence in and of itself, I think, is, is problematic because it implies that the MP3 is doing something. Is the MP3 doing something? Do you think it does something? Gets up, has a nice day, forces <laughs> you to listen to music at a lower cost and a lower quality. And technically, we were talking about how it's not the MP3, but it's the person who developed the MP3 coding that does something. Right, either the developer or the user are real agents. But this casual use of language, this attribution of agency to technologies, I think is a, is a significant point of how these technological deterministic ideas creep into our thinking about technology. Can you think of any others? Yeah. I was going to say, there is something to be said, though, for the idea that these technologies embody, in certain ways, the like, ideas of people. So like, the people who made the MV3 had certain ideas about how people hear and, and listen, and so they, that was sort of built into the MV3. Absolutely. And so in a sense, you could say the MV3 like, it does do stuff. It does like you play it, and it plays like music back and like it has properties, right? right. So like in a certain sense, those properties <coughs> can shape things. They're not like, agency necessarily of the MV3. Right. But they are reflective of like human agency. And That's right. Cycled back. That's it's right. But um, yeah, and it's like, it's sort of this casual use of language that sort of overlooks the humans behind the process. And I think that it's not that that's important to recognize that that process is happening. Can you think of other examples? Of this sort of where we casually sort of give technology a power that it may not really have? I mean, the nuclear bomb overturned warfare in the 20th century. Right. I mean, it's completely different now. All of political science has changed, international relations. And so, I mean, I don't know if you give the agency to the bomb itself or to its inventors, but right. it, it changed a lot. That's true. So. That's true. Uh, and. It, very casually, people say things like the nuclear age transformed geopolitics. But again, the question I raise is, well, was it that or was it the people behind it and the culture that led to that? And is it significant in our language if we make it the distinction? At the same time, I don't know if any of the people who developed it had a choice because at the time there was a competition and so you could look at that as a deterministic factor also that once some you know spark goes off and there's this idea of the nuclear bomb right the, the superpowers have no choice but to develop it and have no choice but to go into the nuclear age that's one of the arguments for technological determinism right. yeah that's once right you're in the nuclear age that's certain you can't leave it it's that's different. yeah that some technology sort of push you like this some would say and i would probably say that we still have control, that we can still make a choice, and getting to that position that we were in was still a choice. I mean, now we're trying for, we're attempting to do nuclear disarmament, and that's a choice to take that away. Whether that can work. But what you can't take away is the knowledge yeah. of how to build a bomb. So even if everyone disarms, then should things get, you know, tense again, people will start building again. Right, so yeah. You really can never go back. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's an argument for. <laughs> I, I think it's optimistic in the sense that, that some people theorize that you can in fact destroy knowledge by, you know, rewriting history books enough and, you know, giving it a thousand years, right? right. right. Yeah. Well, and there's uh, contemporary examples of countries doing that in explicit and well, sure, explicit ways. Destroying any, any knowledge globally? I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to prove. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, again, another, another sort of telltale sign for this is when people say, talk about technology evolving. That's another sort of use of language that, that raises a question for me, because technology itself, in my, in my view, I don't think actually evolves. 
humans of change their usage of technology and technology changes, but to say that technology itself evolves I think is, is a problematic thing. Um, another common way is this idea that t the technologies we have are the best. That's a very common idea. People think, oh, the technologies we have are the best. Are they the best? We don't know. <laughs> this whole umbrella of you know, technological determinism and technology evolves in this direction and the current one is the best. I think people spend a lot of money you know, to make us all believe that particular right. idea. That's right. Particularly some technological tycoons out in Seattle and maybe in Silicon Valley. Yeah, there's a couple of guys I have in mind who, who <laughs> thought that it was certainly in their best interest to make you think that in order to get best access to the internet, you need this best technology browser, which works with this best operating system and right. this best platform, right. and it goes in this way, and yeah. you know, thankfully we make it. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And those ideas, I think, seep into the culture and seep into the discourse, and people who don't engage in technology tend to think that, and they have a sort of resignation that they don't play an active role in technology, that technology is just there, okay, well they buy the product, or they're sort of passive consumers of technology and not active agents in technology. And I think this uh, th idea of technological determinism helps us rem remind ourselves that we are active agents. Well, it may be a little easier for you guys, but uh, <laughs> it's important that everyone realize even those unskilled and untrained are active agents in shaping what technologies happen and what technologies move forward. Um, a lot of people don't see that all the time. Okay, so the last case. Uh, now, in terms of music technology, in music, in our look so far at music technologies, do we have um, examples of, um, does music, our look at music technology support this idea of technological deter determinism, or does it uh, counter it? Can we think of some things we've seen so far? Like, I mean, could the development of like a certain type of instrument follow a logical sequence approach? Like, I don't know, like, starting with like a loop, moving all the way down to the electric guitar? Like a determinist might say, yes, the electric guitar is the logical outcome of the oud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a determinist might say that. Do you think that's true? I don't know. Like, I, I feel like that probably wouldn't be the case because, I, I mean, it's either looking at it like the development and evolution of the instrument you know, affected the course of music history or it's the other way around the music history affected the evolution, if you want to call it, of the instrument. Right. So like, I'd like to give more credit to humans. But <laughs> Me too. I mean, quite a bit of music technology uh, follows computing power, which is determined by literally a law, Moore's law. So It's not determined by Moore's law. <laughs> Moore's law is empirical based on an estimation of what happens. It's not determined. It is a law, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a law. If you're not coming out with a better chip every 18 months, you're breaking the law. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty important that you know, I don't, uh, Is it a law? I don't think you it's, get booted I don't think it's a law. Valley if you don't, you don't do it. <laughs> well, it's, it's real thing. <laughs> it's an economic practice. <laughs> um, so, music tech, go ahead. I, I guess I, what seems to me is it seems very, uh, our discussion seems very confused because we have no way of kind of measuring how successful a theory is. Right, like I, I feel like what we need to be looking at is their predictive power. Right? So if we have a theory that says uh, all the technologies are going to determine what happens next, then we should be able to kind of you know, put these building blocks together from where we are now and, and say, okay, 10 years down the line, here's exactly what's going what's to be there. And uh, then you know, we can measure that. Right. <laughs> um, this hasn't happened. Right. Then. These theories have been around for a long time, so I feel like the ones that claim that things are determinist or deterministic, uh, that th they should really be able to back that up, and they haven't. Right. So. I agree. And that makes it very clear and simple. But I find what I find really interesting is that these ideas of technological deter determinism sort of seep into our culture and seep into our discourse, even though, as you point out there, there's some ways where very clearly it could be tested and could be shown to not always follow in, in, in many well, they, cases. They do say, like you mentioned, uh, Robert Heilbronner in there, and Heilbronner has this thing about technology that one of the reasons that you might think a way true, not like a proof or anything, is that people have predicted historically technological development. That's right. Which is sort of a crazy idea, I think, because it's not like they predicted a lot of things. Yeah. And so it's sort of hard, like that's right. a, a way to test this. Like Nostradamus is right three out of a thousand times exactly. or something so like that. So it's like people say right. that there's going to be like flying skateboards. And <laughs> and there's all these things that people predict. 
and so those things don't exist. Right. Well, there is the issue of, of sort of simultaneous discovery where people separated in different regions come up with the same inventions at the same time. There's many examples of that, which is kind of an interesting case. But again, to music technologies. I mean, I think music technologies pose an interesting challenge to this idea of technological determinism because, one, we see the role of aesthetics and cultural factors making the choices that determine what technologies are successful and how they are used. Uh, nobody intended the, the disc-based uh, player of a gramophone to be used as a musical instrument for altering the playback speed. Um, nobody intended the components of a radio to be hacked together to build a synthesizer. Um, nobody intended uh, countless other examples of, of of repurposing. That was one of our articles talked about the idea of repurposing technologies. We see many examples of that in music technology. We were talking about uh, the attraction to 8-bit technologies. We see people going back to older technologies, inferior technologies, for aesthetic reasons, not for a technological logical sequence. Um, and I think those give us some interesting examples of, of deviating from the deterministic approach. Yeah, no, I abso absolutely agree. And especially, what you were saying is that the in order to subscribe to the deterministic view, you need to have some sort of predictive power. You know, it, it enumerates that you're actually committing some kind of fallacy that's really common, which is to say, because it did happen in this direction, uh, you forget that there were other possible directions that it could have gone into that were dependent on a bunch of factors you didn't even think about. You know, I wonder how dependent rock and roll and all of the uh, technologies that go along with it, be, be it distortion pedals or different kinds of guitars and pickups, right. is dependent on World War II and, you know, the, the, the baby boomer generation happening and the rebellious kids and stuff. You mean just independent of the technology? Yeah, That's happened, right. We never have distortion pedals, right? Like, right. <laughs> but it's probably true. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the Scott model talks about an interconnected web. And I don't like to give agency to machines. That's just my personal opinion. If you guys want to give agency to the machines in your lives, that's good for you. Agency to machines and generative music, though? No, not at all. In fact, <laughs> I've argued very strenuously for, for the opposite of that. Um, and that's a case where it becomes really, really interesting. Um, but uh, this is a really, I think, a useful thing for us to think about as we move forward. Other comments? Okay, let's uh, make some noise.